Ellen, you tell me that you started trying to stop saying um and uh when you yes, were teaching. When I was te- when I was a, a TA in graduate school at UCLA yeah. in comparative literature, um, I wanted to sound good. So I cut sure. my ums and uhs. I was pretty good at it, actually. I really cut a lot of ums and uhs. And I got at least two and possibly three, although that just seems impossible to me, but at least two comments in my evaluations, the student evaluations at the end of the quarter, they said that I was I was fine as a teacher, but that I had some weird long pauses when I was teaching. Yep. So I stopped, I stopped cutting them after that. Good. <laughs> I figured, I figured it was creating more trouble. I don't think I have that many. So I figured it was creating more trouble than it was worth. And I'm not opposed to them either. So yeah, there you go. I, I leave in ums and uhs in the edit because I think that they're meaningful unless it's distracting because everything needs to serve the show. If it serves the show, it doesn't detract, then I'll I'll do it. Are you gonna are we gonna take a vow of obedience before this begins? A vow of obedience. Everything this... serves the show. Everything serves the show. <laughs> I didn't I didn't know about this part. Feel... Hello and welcome to this very special live bonus patron grammar episode of Because Language, a show about linguistics, the science of language. My name's Daniel Midgley. Let's meet the team. We have my friend and podcast pal, Ben Ainsley. Ben, if you were the manager of some kind of table, what kind of table would it be? Uh, Manage some kind of table. I interpreted that as like at a restaurant. Is okay. that what you mean? Would you, okay. would, you would commandeer yeah. a restaurant table. That's a very good... Um, I believe uh, so. Ben, like do you remember what our guest does? <laughs> oh, ground I'm, table. Right, 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 right. Yep. Wor- that makes that makes a lot of sense. Well, because without... without Anyway, without brain cells, apparently, it's, it's very difficult to decipher. Um, I'm still going to go with restaurant table. I would manage restaurant table. I would be like a very charming, but probably quite a feat... Um, like wait person who's just like all right people what are we doing today let's have a good time i like how you're only commandeering one table which would make a very easy waiting job exactly yeah Yeah. it'd be like a michelin star restaurant right like i'm i'm just like i'm laser focused on just like one group precisely all right and we also have my friend and also my podcast pal hedvig hurgard hedvig same question what kind of table would you commandeer well I think that it's really emotionally draining to sit and have people ask whatever they want of you all the time. <laughs> um, it sounds it sounds like you'd get exhausted. I don't know if that's the way Ellen feels or not, but I've been in Sweden now for two months and met up with a lot of old friends and had to answer the same questions a bunch of times. Where do you live now? How long have you been living there? Where in Sweden are you staying right now? And it's the same questions, about 10 of them that are rotated over like 20 or 40 different people and it's driving me nuts. So I need a table that um, where it doesn't drive me nuts. How about a a massage table? That might be more relaxing. No, my fingers are not good with that. Um, Something that's like, can I just like, oh, oh, I know. I'll talk to people about my techniques for falling asleep. Oh, very good. Okay. Uh, like you, you'll be that mm-hmm. person with the table and the little sign that's just like, I have kooky sleep habits. Ask me anything. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I would choose a coffee table or perhaps even a dining room table because you have the meal and then everyone's sort of still sitting there and I've cleared away the dishes and then you just have really good chats. and. Some of, the best, some of the best chats come that way. You disgustingly wholesome man. I am. We have a very special guest with us. It's author of Rebel with a Clause, Tales and Tips from a Roving Grammarian. She is the proprietor of the Grammar Table, from which she dispenses advice, knowledge, and wisdom all about all things grammatical. With us for the fourth time, it's Ellen Joven. Hey, Ellen. Thank you. Will I be getting a jacket in honor of this occasion? 
<laughs> You've been listening. Yes, you do. <laughs> A little sequined one. <laughs> oh, good. I love sparkly things. This is yeah. fantastic. News. Like a rhinestone cowgirl. Send me your size. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, tell us about Grammar Table. What's the mission? Why do you do it? What is it? I began it uh, about five point something years ago uh, to set up on the streets of New York City with a uh, pop-up grammar advice stand. And people just come up to me and ask me language questions. The why is because it seemed like fun. And is it? Oh my gosh, so much fun. <laughs> I never get tired of it. <laughs> I really, I mean, sometimes my life interferes with doing it and that's annoying. I love it so much. Yep. Yep. So are you getting recognized? That's the question because you're, I don't, I don't know if you're an institution yet, but I think you might be a fixture. <laughs> are you getting, uh, are you, uh, are you <laughs> recognized? Hey, you're that lady. Well, a lot of my neighbors know me now. I have I have sat in the same place too much for them to really to miss me. But when I I've taken this to all 50 states and the first 47 were pre COVID, the last three were post COVID. So there mm -hmm. was an interval there, you know, a lapse and I wasn't going out much and all that kind of stuff. But um, the two of the last three states were Alaska and Hawaii. In Alaska, I was on the side of a mountain on a hiking trail. And two of the people who came by and they weren't together knew about the grammar table. And then I was on a beach, an isolated beach. Um, it was Kailua Beach, I believe, um, in Hawaii as my last state. And it was pretty isolated there too. And two women ran up to me and said they had just finished my book. So those are oh. my, that is not, <laughs> but, but on the other hand, um, I can go to a, a school and no one has any idea of anything. You know, like a school with hundreds of people and no one has any clues. So There's nothing more humbling than teenagers. Wow. I know. Mm. Mm. <laughs> they, they will, no matter how good you're feeling that day, they will bring you right back down to earth. <laughs> I've discovered that um, even young university students can be pretty humbling because I'm <laughs> desperately trying to make them like me, of course. <laughs> and I'm trying with various like memes and pop culture references. And they're just like not impressed at all i think you found the but secret it's okay they're smart <laughs> i'm fine it's fine everything's fine it's fine <laughs> i think eighth graders are especially challenging eighth mm. grade mm. yeah it's that age that, um, that yeah. most simian dip of human cognition the awkward age it's coming up on National Grammar Day in the USA, so we wanted to invite Ellen Joven to celebrate with us because grammar is amazing. Um, we want to point out that the language of this episode is English, but we will also entertain questions about the grammars of other languages to the best of our ability. We are joined by many of our great friends and listeners in chat. We want to see who's here with us. Um, if you want to, put where you are in chat and we can read some out. You can make it any level of granularity that you feel comfortable. <laughs> All right, we've got uh, Diego joining us from LA. We've got well, Robin that's in Seattle. my hometown, Seattle. that's where I grew up. Oh, really? We've got Nikolai mm -hmm. in the Americas. Nikolai, I'm going to accept <laughs> that level of specificity. Our stamina in Miami. <laughs> the entire Western Hemisphere. <laughs> Dustin says, on my parents' couch. Dustin would say that, of course. Um, that's a level of specificity that is very specific, but also Quite anonymous. Very nice. Uh, Linda in Florida, Steele in Washington, D.C., Anika in Boston, oh, Coco in, Coco's not in, in the usual place. Uh, oh, man, Colleen, again, Southwest Washington State. We've got Portland. We've got L.A. We've got, oh, Wendy's in Basque country. Very nice. Wow. Okay. Hey, where's my, where's my Perth people? If you're in Perth, I really want to hear from you, except for Ben, not you. Shut up, Daniel. I am in Perth. Actually, we're in Burlo. We're on uh, Wajuk Nunga Country. Hey, I wanted to say that. So, okay. Once you get to Basque Country, what do you do? <laughs> it sounds really hard to speak. Well, thank you all for your support, your suggestions, your show ideas, your sociality on Discord. We love doing these live shows with you. And that's just one of the benefits of being a patron. So if you're listening to this not live, Think of becoming a patron and watching us live. We have fun and you'll be supporting the show. And those are good things. Now, if you're listening on audio, that is great. You will soak up many linguistic insights that way. But 
Um, you can also watch this episode on our YouTube account. We are Because Lang Pod, and the advantages are number one, you can see us. A dubious advantage at this time of the morning. <laughs> such, such advantage. So great. Uh, you'll also be able to see the great, helpful, and occasionally hilarious comments that people are making in chat. So feel free to swap over to our YouTube channel using the link in the podcast description. And if you are watching us in video form, throw us a like. That way the algorithm shows us to more people. All right. So are we ready to tackle some grammar questions? I, I I have assumed the position, which it would seem is very close to the previous position I had assumed anyway. Okay, very good. Now, Ellen, would you like to tell us about your exploits on social media and polling? Oh, sure. Well, I love doing grammar polls or lang it can be grammar adjacent. I'm not particular about hewing only to the domain of grammar. Um, just anything that's languagey. Um, I like to post polls on social media to see sometimes to see um what just to see what people think about something that's total gray area sometimes to quiz something that's more has a more specific correct or incorrect answer um, i like posting ones about pronunciation i use them sometimes to i usually post out of it i have a fit of curiosity that's usually the thing that inspires me to do it um so i might just like i, I was sitting in the coffee shop this morning um, and I posted a coffee shop poll. So that's just how it goes. You know, I, I think we're going to see that one too. Want to know, want to know, <laughs> want to know what people think about things. And I just like, it's, it's an extension of the table because even though it's remote, I'm still getting to interact with people. All right. Well, uh, shall we tackle a few of your recent ones or even ones that maybe aren't so recent or that haven't even been seen before? And we'll see what our listeners uh, judge grammatically. Does that sound all right? That sounds great. All right. Well, here we go. Here's number one. It says, Swahili is one of the languages that has always fascinated Aaron or that have always fascinated Aaron. I'm going to be quiet for a second and let you settle that in your mind and vote. I'm going to sing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. We definitely need someone to make us like a Jeopardy ripoff. <laughs> yeah, think music. Do, do, the votes do, are coming do, in. Do, 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 20 people have do, voted. By do, the way, Ben, you get to on this one because Ellen's the co-host, so you have voting rights. Yes. I thought uh, you were I thought you were suggesting that I get two votes for everyone else's one and I was like, "Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, as it should always have been." Would would you like two votes, Ben? No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. It's like playing Mafia or Werewolf and being the mayor and getting two votes and then everyone being like, oh, well, here's the kingmaker. Have it? I was just going to say that I'm really interested in this because I I know in theory how this works in English, but I struggle with it. And um, I've always blamed that I'm not a native speaker, but uh, when I've been here in Sweden, I've realized that uh, we conjugate adjectives for a number. And apparently I can't do that properly either. <laughs> <laughs> so, you've got you've got the you've got the Seymour Skinner thing. Like uh, it, am, am I the problem? No, no. It's grammar that is at yeah. fault. If you go back through our transcripts, there's a bit where Hedvig tells us that she actually why you got your Swedish teaching license revoked because you were no longer oh, yeah. Swedish enough. Well, the linguists at Stockholm University have said I'm not allowed to tell foreigners how things work. And I think that <laughs> I'm now teaching at Uppsala University, and I think the Uppsala University crowd is starting to catch on as well. <laughs> I know linguistics. The grift. You just got to move from different, <laughs> move to different towns like Joseph Smith and just like keep the grift yeah. going. You've got, yeah, you've got yeah. a different family in every university. Um, Let's check the results for this one. Let's see what our respondents said. It looks like 82% of our respondents said has, that Swahili is one of the languages that has always fascinated Aaron, and only 18% of us said have. So it looks like a lot of us were persuaded by the singular. Ellen, what's the expected mm -hmm. answer? What's the right prescriptive answer? Because Swahili is one of the languages, I gotta say, my year eight teacher, who was a switched on grammar person, she always said, just take out any prepositional phrases when you're trying to figure out subject verb agreement. So one of the languages, she would have said, you take out 
of the languages that leaves us with one. Does that sound right, Ellen? What's what's your advice on this? Well, I, I like questions with complications. So it's rarely yeah. extremely straightforward with any of the questions. I mean, it can, I guess occasionally it is, but this is not one of those examples. Yeah. Um, so what you just cited, the take out the prepositional phrase thing, that works if you have a, a simple independent clause, a main clause with say a noun or a pronoun followed by a prepositional phrase, and then you're picking the verb to go with it. But that's not what we have here. We have Swahili is the subject, and then is is the verb that corresponds to that, right? Singular subject, singular verb. Good so far? And then you okay. have one. Yeah. And then that, now we're into, we're entering the subject complement terrain. This is Swahili equals one, okay? And then all of these things are attached to the one. One of the languages that, and we have here a relative clause. I don't know if this is familiar terminology or if you might use different terminology, but that has or have always fascinated Aaron is an adjectival clause modifying that. And then the question is, is that, does that have a, this is how I would do it technically in a prescriptive sense. It's just not what people think is correct, no matter no, what no, whether they're this doing. Is, this is what he asked for. He, he was like, I wanted get, to know. get the rule, <laughs> get the rule book out. Give me the so, ruler. So the simple, like a simpler way of explaining this is, Swahili is one of the multiple languages that, and then does it make, does that make you want to change your answer at all? Anyone? Does that make you want to go plural where you went singular before? Maybe a little. Cause that's the idea here. It's one a of a bucket bit. of multiple languages yeah. that have always fascinated Aaron. Right. Oh, yeah, true. yeah. That kind of intuitively does jibe in my there, head. There are a bunch of them. Yeah. yeah. The that refers back to the languages. It doesn't refer back to Swahili. It doesn't refer back to one, but you have so many singulars. You have Swahili, singular noun. You have is, you have one, and it just makes people want a singular verb. So I do put have here in writing, but I know that a lot of people think it's wrong. And I have mixed feelings about it because it sounds weird to the ear because typically in speech through most of my life, I would have just used a singular verb, but it really is one of the multiple languages that have of this bucket that have always fascinated Aaron. So it's not the structure that your teacher was talking about. This is this is a little bit of a case of according to the rules, um, this is a dog that quacks and flaps a little bit. Well, I think the problem with the rules as they are often taught is that they are over. I don't even think the rule, the way it's taught normally is so oversimplified. It's often that later you know, you, te you learn it in this sort of simplified context, and then language is actually much messier and more complicated. Right. You, know, you study mm -hmm. the grammar of relatively simple structures, but you don't always go that deep. And so when you really start to look at this, there, there are multiple things going on. You have the main clause, and then you have a, 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 a relative a kind of dependent clause that modifies the, uh, the, the subject complement. Fancy, right? So no yeah. one's ever going to, you know, most people will not notice if you put has, and many people notice if you put have. So it's not, you have to decide philo philosophically what kind of a conjugator you want to be. Yeah. Well, Ellen, can I ask you? <laughs> Ellen, can I thing? ask you a question too? Oh, Linda first. Um, Go ahead. What you're saying is that you've got Swahili is one. So you've got your subject, your verb is, and then you've got your subject complement one. But then you've got of the languages, which is a prepositional phrase. And we know that a prepositional phrase itself can be a subject or an object, but that's not what it's doing here because it's followed by the word that, which gives you a relative clause. So what you're right. saying is that Swahili is your relative clause. The relative clause takes, takes place of a complement in this structure. And since Swahili is one, it's saying Swahili is one singular. That is why your verb should be singular. I know it's pedantic, but that is the way I learned it. That is how we roll around here today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pe pe pedantry, I'm not sure. There was, the there was the a day. point where I went off the, off the railroad track, so I didn't follow that all the way through to the end. But um, if this sentence were um, what, uh, one of the languages I like, one of the languages, okay, he's studying five languages. One of the languages is Swahili. Then it would follow the rule, Daniel, that you mentioned initially. One is the subject of the language. It, well, the whole, the whole subject really is one of the languages. But the, the subject that you would have learned for purposes of verb conjugation would be one of the languages would be a modifier for that. 
And then clearly it would be one is, you don't do one of the languages are. But this is, if you diagram this, you have is one. And when I say diagram, I'm talking about the old fashioned diagramming, which some of you may remember from school and some of you won't, but you would have one. So, um, and then under that, you would have of prepositional phrase, languages object, the below languages. And then you would have a dotted line that goes down to a new clause. And that would be the subject of that clause. The verb has or have is, is matched up with that. And then always fascinated, Aaron. This is a tr troubling one to start with. Yeah, Daniel, come on, man. <laughs> we go hard. <laughs> we, we go hard. I, it's really my fault. Sorry. No, it's cool. I chose these. You gave me a ton. I could have done a lot of different things here. I had choices. Here it is. Second one. Roxy Music is or Roxy Music are an English rock band formed in 1971. Since then, it has played or since then they have played at arenas around the world. This is a multiple choice thing. So you can choose any of these. You can choose is and are, is or are. Don't choose both. You can choose it has or they have. We're going to see what happens. Wait, I don't think you, I have um, an objection. These, these are not, <laughs> no, no. I understand. I understand what you're saying, Ellen. These aren't mutually exclusive choices. You can choose more than Oh, okay. One. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I, I decided to do it this way so that you can choose is and they have or any combination. And Daniel, um, dummy Ben question time. After I've submitted it, how do I get it back up? Or do you have to put it back up for everyone? I have to put it back up, but I'm going to okay. leave it here for a while. So um, yeah, yeah. let's talk through it while people are making their choices. I was going to say, when you're dealing with subject verb agreement, as we have been, you can go three different ways in the research that I've seen. You can go structural, which is what we've been talking about. You can kind of go um, proximal where the nearest thing kind of leaves a singular or plural impression as we had in the last one with languages. And that kind of colors things a little bit, independent of structure. And then you can kind of go notional. And that depends on whether you feel like Roxy Music is a singular entity or a plural entity for the purposes of this discussion. So the results are filtering in. Ellen, do you, while that's going on, do you have any feelings on this? I'm still upset about the languages one. <laughs> We'll come back and to you're it. Gonna have, I, just, I have a fixation. I just, I just before I before I respond to this, I just want to say that I'm seeing the comments, but I can't fully attend to what's happening now in front of me. But I want to acknowledge the pain that I'm seeing in the comments. Um, and <laughs> do you want me to repeat the? Now, is it time for me to repeat the the? Was this for Linda that I was going to repeat it? The sentence, the way I said it, just for that sure. one. Sure. I'm just going back. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Of the language, what was my sentence again? Of the languages that have always fascinated Aaron, Swahili is just one. So you can hear that the that is really conceptually tied more to languages. But I see other comments. You know, could you argue that it's tied to one? I think based on a logic basis, if you draw a diagram of it, like not a diagram, like the traditional sentence diagram, but actually draw, you know, the languages and then the one language, Swahili in the middle, and then like think about what really saying i think you can't really make the argument but i can certainly live with the singular and i'm not going to chase after you i just want you all to know that yep or judge this you. Is, i won't again, judge the, you i won't judge like, you <laughs> okay now just roxy Ellen music with a table under her arm being like no i'm not finished <laughs> but, but i love so now this topic though roxy music i love this band i love the band thing because every time i go to a wikipedia british english entry one that's written in british english it often has a sing it'll have a singular band name and then a plural verb. And if I post it for American English speakers, it completely flips people out. It causes, <laughs> it causes, it causes okay. trauma. And I, it's funny okay. because they must see them. They must see them. People Google bands all the time, right? But also, um, I, I wanted to uh, tag on to that, Ellen, if I may, about this thing about like grammar as a feeling and variation being okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We love this. So like variation, like we can deal with a lot of variation. If if anything, sometimes when we have a preference, it's equally valid as like our aesthetic preferences. Like I don't like lime green. I don't go around, you know, shouting at people wearing lime green sweaters. And if oh, I understand. Really? You should give people, it a try. It's very, it's very rewarding. In other words. I had lime green. Yeah. I, in college, in college, I had lime green pointy pumps. Pointy pumps. All right. Well, I hated that. That sounds <laughs> cool. Hate your pumps. But 
but um it's not like as as long as I get it and and I just feel like people make a mountain out of a molehill sometimes I yeah um, and they want to like present a really logical rational system and like I've studied languages I know that if something is very frequent it often behaves irregularly so me we often feel like if we can find a reason why something should be so it therefore must be so and I don't think right. that's true yep uh, for yeah, this one, I'm gonna I'm gonna point. steal wholesale from the comments. Termi for the previous question said this is a duck rabbit for me. Like depending on which way I look at it, it can definitely go both ways. Referencing that wonderful, you know, like image of like, is it a duck? Is it a rabbit? Um, this one is a hundred percent that for me, right? Because bands one hundred percent exist in my head as singular entities and then you see mm -hmm. a band play and they 100 percent exist as a group of people doing a thing right yeah. like muse is a singular artistic entity whom i love but there's three guys who make up muse like it's just that both of those things are 100 percent true simultaneously yep so so are you and is they have it, yeah what did you say that you vote that, is and that's they have? exactly what i said is and they have yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see what we got, dude. I'm going to share the results. Yep. Most of us were is they have. Check it out. <laughs> How can we account for this? It's just is why would it be? Why would we mentally think of them as one entity and then like one sentence later, think of them as a multiple entity? What's what's going on? What's what's triggering this shift, Ellen? Cognitive dissonance. Sorry. Life is chaos. <laughs> <laughs> and death is coming for us all. I see a comment from Liz. My grammar book says it depends on whether the noun is being considered as a block or as a bunch of individuals doing stuff. And what I, I mean, that's that's generally true. What I find, though, is that it's very hard for many American English speakers to think of, of a group as individuals. So, for example, the couple is versus the couple are or the family is versus the family are. It's very natural for me to use plural verbs with those. I, I use both. So it you know, and I, I'm not particular about it, but for a lot of people, it just sounds wrong here in New York City where I live. I would do is and they are, they have here. Like for me that I, there's not really, Probably. I really can't say Roxy music are, that that would be re really unnatural for me, but mm. I definitely am not going to be, well, I've, I, I find a, an editorial type who's remembering what they learned in English here might do, it has, and I can't do that. There's no way, yeah. that's not happening. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Brain says no. Let's do our third one here. And I am going to launch number three. I think this is our laptop example. Oh, that's yep. very tiny. I think I'm going <laughs> to. I can see it. I can see it. I can see it. Well, can you I'm read the only it person who us? matters, obviously. Would you can please you read, read it, it line by line to us? Oh, okay. yeah, please. Uh, so there is a big. Uh, so I'm going to do it for the sake of people who can't see the image at all. You've got a um, laminated A4 sign posted on what is presumably like a library door or something like that. Pardon? What, what's the cafe door? Yes. It's a cafe. It was um, a cafe okay. door. Yeah. All right. Um, and there's a, a, like a clip art picture of a laptop with the big red cancel sign overlaid over the top of it. And below it is the text No laptops, new line, Saturday and Sunday only, new line. Thank you for understanding. End of words. Okay. I think I, I love this example because this is not about <laughs> grammar. This is about like communication in a pure condensed sense. Yeah. I was pretty excited about this one when I saw it. Yeah. This is really fun. This is I love and it. I did get a I did get we got food and drink here too, by the way. It's a very nice little cafe. But I saw the sign when I was walking in and I thought, I bet that causes trouble. <laughs> I, I, the thing I wonder about is like, I go beyond the language of this and I go back to when I was a waiter and like <laughs> managing, managing, managing hospitality one benches table. and stuff. I always feel like, like, I, I feel like I understand what this sign is probably asking, I think, but I, I'm a bit perplexed that this isn't like a self regulating system because. When cafes get busy enough, they're just horrible places to use laptops anyway, I find. Then you have this to know when it's This place has a busy. sofa. It has a sofa. And the person uh, who ends up on the sofa could really stay on the sofa for a long time. 
Gotcha. Gotcha. Just consuming that um, non-infinite renewable resource. Mm-hmm. This this breakdown is really how the poll was going last I checked on Twitter as well. You can see the results, but nobody else can. And and, and I can. Oh, so, OK. Yeah. All okay. right. I'm not, I'm not going to say we're the only yet. two. All right. Well, should we uh, hold on? Uh, Submitted. Not, there we go. Sorry. I forgot to fill it in. Not everyone's done yet. We still got a couple of stragglers and they're confused. Because what, what what happened was you see the picture and then there's like, you have to scroll down to actually see the options. I was just going like, oh, Daniel shared a pretty picture with us. How nice. Oh, my picture's tiny, but okay. All right. I'm going to close it off. Let's see what happened. I'm sharing I agree. the results. By the way, in, in comments, Steele has said, um, I don't think there's a correct answer. I think this is a terrible sign. And I think he is actually the closest to a, to a sort of a fundamental truth on this, this question. I are, love this result. I'm curious whether are people, are people surprised by the results looking at this? Is this what you expected? No. So should we say on the record what the results are? So um, 35% voted for on Saturday and Sunday, which is what I did. Right, and meaning 65%... laptops are banned on Saturday and Sunday. You, you're yeah, allowed on and Saturday 65%, and Sunday. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're allowed on them Saturday and Sunday. Because I, I figured, I was just using pure contextual knowledge, and I figured maybe this is a place that get less visitors on the weekend, and therefore laptops are allowed. My Australian brain really struggles struggles to comprehend this idea that a la- that a cafe could possibly be less busy on the weekend. It just doesn't make any sense to an Australian. <laughs> <laughs> right? Maybe that was a bad assumption. Uh, I I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure that the actual intended meaning is that you are allowed to use your laptops Monday through Friday. But if I thought about it, when I started to think about it, I thought, well, maybe people don't really bring their laptops in on Saturday and Sunday because they're not. They're having fun. They're not working. So maybe this is an issue during the week when people are using it as their home office. So it's, it's I'm not such 100% a bad sign. Sure. <laughs> and and also, I just want to comment. This is now we're now we're entering a sort of um, a moral dimension of the grammar table, which is I really don't want to make people feel bad by using their examples. This wasn't meant to make anyone feel bad. It wasn't meant to say, oh. This is, you know, no, this is the most ridiculous. No it wasn't like that. It was it was because I thought it was interesting and kind of amusing because it did make my brain do do cart some cartwheels and backflips and now my spine hurts. But <laughs> but it's um it's uh it's just interesting. I like real life examples. I love bathroom signs. Bathroom signs are the best for analyzing the grammar. Do you ever do that? I mean, there's some, some of them have so much data to work with. It's like a 10 page, I mean, a 10 bullet list of things you can or cannot do in the bathroom stall. So I find them very entertaining. <laughs> I yeah, know. yeah. Like, like you're not I... supposed to sit with your feet on the thing. Yeah. But I love, <laughs> I love uh, these really kind of science and public ones. spaces because I also think of them as like a bit of a design failure. Like almost every building I've ever worked in has an A4 printed out that says you're not allowed to use the lift in the case of fire. Yes. And they're always like handmade by someone who works in that building. And I'm like, why isn't this an engraved sign attached (laughs) to the elevator? (laughs) Like why Why is everyone reinventing the wheel? Embossed relief from floor to ceiling on the door. She's like, if fire, no lift. Wait, do you mean is there an is there a question of authority then? Like, did some random passerby just pose this to mess with us? <laughs> Maybe it's not a real it's not a real rule. There is an engraved sign, but it's too small. Usually, is yeah, the thing, okay. and then yeah. people have made a bigger sign and bigger. And sometimes it's for information where it's like this has been the case in this building for the last twenty years. So like, and the same with toilet things, where I read those things and I'm like, oh, this is a failure of design. Why did anyone ever get the idea that? Blah, blah, blah. You know, I yeah. didn't realize that just conversationally you use A4 to refer to the paper. Mm. But yeah. Big time. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. It yes. is a wonderful size. No, it's okay. It was interesting. Mm. Okay. Yeah. No, I, said that, I said the same thing, didn't I? I was like, oh, there's an A4 laminated yeah. sheet. Like, on yeah. The, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's really not an A4. It's eight and a half by 11 inches. Oh, because it's, it's just US letter. letter because <laughs> it's <US> letter. Oh, <laughs> Americans. <laughs> Oh. But A4 just means papers of roughly that size. Does it? Yeah. Doesn't it have no. a particular dimension though? It, well, no, it I mean, it does. does. Yeah, no, oh, Hedwig okay. means in our like metric. But a peanut is not a nut, etc. 
One day I'm okay. going to come over there and sort out this U.S. letter stuff. And on that day, <laughs> I will describe it with this year, 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 month, month, day, day. <laughs> that is what I'm going to do. Now I'm going to go to number four. I am wielding okay. the broom of... Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Have what? we settled? Have we settled what the actual intent of the sign was? Have we? Did you ask them? No, I'm going to have to go. No, I, I, I'll i have to go ask. Okay. I, I just sent, <laughs> I sent an email because I was a little worried they would see it on, on social media and think that I was trying to be mean. And I, so I sent them a nice little note. So yeah, we need to send our lady, a lady in the trenches to go, okay. to go and figure it out. <laughs> We're moving on to number four. The question is, do you use whose to refer back to non-human entities? Such as? Like a wall, a book, an idea. Okay. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of an example. The, the book whose jacket well, is sitting on the table. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, that's nice. That kind okay. of thing. Thank you. The bicycle Instead whose owner of just left. What? Instead of that. <laughs> that's a great question. Instead yeah, I need what? to know I... what I'm choosing between. What? That? Yeah, that's what I would have thought. The book that's jacket is sitting on the table. That's jacket. Oh, that's what? Okay. Yeah, it's... It's... The, the book. Book. Wait, wait. Well, what well, hey, Daniel, like then I agree with Hedvig. If if it's not that, what what is well, the alternative? What is... <laughs> proposing? Are we giving away I the structured... answer? Okay, so this is this is a little okay. tricky. I kind I'm wishing that I put it in a particular context, but the questions that you're asking are kind of the whole problem okay. with the idea. Right. As because people, talk. I have had this on the speakeasy before and people say, no, I mean, it was, uh, it was Mark, the, uh, the radio guy uh, who fancies himself a bit of a stickler. Hi, Mark. And he says, no, no, who is for people. And that is for uh, non-human people. And, my answer is, I think I like which. I'm just going to use which for everything. Oh, you would, you man from the Pacific Northwest. I would. <laughs> right. There, there, this was inspired by the fact that, that many people, especially in the U.S., I'm not sure how widespread this is in other English-speaking countries, but many people believe that you, you have to use who is, who is for people and who's the associated forms. Um, that is not for people. And if you use it for people, you've just insulted the people, you know, to refer back to like the people that sure. I know, that kind of thing, that that would be a problem. And that, and then that, I'm done. That's it. Mm, mm, mm. So they are, they get, they, this, this generates and like anger because you don't want to dehumanize people, right. that kind of thing. I'm going to, wow. I'm going to go with whom's now. The book, whom's jacket <laughs> is on the table. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just, I am just to really throw a grenade in the mix. We have one strike. You know, the, what you would say is the book, the jacket of which is on the table. Oh, okay. It's getting worse and worse as we go along. That it's was terrible. very well done, Daniel. I mean, that takes that burns off a lot of calories right there. I strive for <laughs> correctness, no matter how many <laughs> calories, even if it makes me burn less calories. Oh, what have I done? Oh, oh. It does feel it does it does feel sometimes when you're talking with someone who authentically engages in like uh, King's English or received pronunciation or whatever. I like I love that Ellen just described it as burning a lot of cal calories because sometimes you really do get the impression when they catch themselves in a funky little like grammar loop and then they have to go on this like circuitous turn in the garden path to get back around to the meaning. It's like you could just say the ugly word. It's fine. We all understand. It's like, mm -hmm. no, no, <laughs> mm -hmm. no, 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 no. Once, once must never engage in. <laughs> All right, cool. You got it. No so let's see. 55% of us admit to using who's to refer to non human entities. 32% of us are lying and say no. And then 14% <laughs> of us just don't know. No, but seriously, there's just no good way to do it sometimes, for example. And it's even kind of been semi lexified, for example, an idea whose time has come. This is an idea whose time has come. I was just. A about to say that did i burst your example i'm sorry may i may i also read an example from thomas hardy though of course. okay i brought this one one <laughs> side of the churchyard this is from the mayor of casterbridge i love thomas hardy so i've read all his his uh his novels one side of the churchyard the side toward the towards the weather and by the way did you hear that towards people are always beating me up about oh. that i like my towards with the s's 
nice. towards the weather was sheltered by an ancient thatched mud hall whose eaves overhung as much as one or two feet. So the whose is referring back to the mud wall. So I like this example because a, a lot of a lot of my questions are designed to kind of um, undermine common beliefs about grammar that I think get in people's way. It's not meant to be a gotcha thing. Um, I do actually something like this where I word when I do word questions like this, it's kind of funny sometimes because or or even if I don't word it this way, people will say I never ever do that. And then Twitter is such a great collection of data, and you can often search depending on what the topic is, you can just search on the phrase and their handle, and you can instantly find that yeah, they did that last week. Um, I don't point that out anymore. I did that once, and it didn't. Go, <laughs> it's strangely, it didn't go well. I thought what the happened? reality would be <laughs> the person got mad. But anyway, uh, surprisingly, what, <laughs> um, but, but I thought the injection of reality was just illuminating. I wasn't trying to be mean about it. Um, but anyway, everyone does. Everyone does this. I mean, it's just in such it's a fixture in speech because you can't avoid it. Um, and I think even in writing, probably pretty much everyone has done it. Some of them are easier to get rid of than the one the example you started out with, Daniel. But it's just English. It's the way English is. Who's is our thing for ob for object references as well? Are people surprised? Are people surprised when they're expecting a ruler wrapping grammar tablearian and they get you and you say things like, Come on, man. You can make a case for it either way. And you don't get bent out of shape. Um, maybe I don't know. I mean, I think I look fairly friendly sitting there. I'm not. I really don't look like I'm about to beat people up for using you're not, hyphens. You know, giving in off way I vibes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I do get approached by people who are clearly not going to be dissuaded from any belief they've held <laughs> about language. That must be. Uh, that and, must yeah, be really frustrating, right? Surely, where, where you're just like, look, if. If you've come here completely unplastic, like what what is this interaction about? Yeah. Well, well they, they wanted to talk to like, someone who also knows how it works and then they could sit in agreement of how it works, I think. I see. I see. The agreement right, table think, with Ellen they, Joven. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just subject verb agreement, it's agreement with me. <laughs> yeah, and I and I do I have a strategy for that. Sometimes I'll say something that I think will be accepted at least a little bit, but I don't always you because a tidbit. not everyone, not everyone is there. And I can also just be a friendly table. I don't feel that I'm sacrificing my principles because it's not going to make a difference one way or another. And I mean, things that really create a lot of heat, like ending with a preposition, that kind of thing, often you just have to let it go. I mean, they're lucky to get you because like, I, I heard someone say that like linguists have like a tiny, you know, language prescriptivist in their head and part of linguistics education is like quieting that one down. I think I did linguistics too early and I am too funny in the head. I have the opposite, which is like <laughs> agree, a little chaos hey, clown. A little chaos clown that is like, how can I make this funny? How can I like poke at people? What can I do to upset them? And that's the one that I actually need to keep in check. And I feel like Ellen is somewhere in between those two. Um, and and that's probably lucky for her, the people she interacts so you could with. Have the, you could have the naughty grammar table. <laughs> Whoa, I would just be like, hey, what if we put all the words you said in a bag and we pull them out randomly and we see how much sense it makes? Maybe it works. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Ben has described it this way, and I remember Ben saying this. Some people are like, I use correct grammar. I use prescriptive grammar, and that makes me better. And then some of us say, well, I'm a descriptivist, and that makes me better. <laughs> and it's, it's I'm kind not even of interested thing. in better or worse. I'm just interested in annoying I'm... people. Okay. <laughs> that's that's, by the way, Hedvig, that's another way of saying worse. You're worse. Okay. The, the <laughs> other way I've described it, I've had grammar classes where I've taught grammar, but the attendees were approaching the grammar class in the same way that people in a small town approach the newspaper. Not to find right. out the facts, but to find out if the reporter got it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's um, interesting. That's an interesting hmm. way to describe it. Yeah. Now, Edwin asks, my question to Ellen would be, how seriously she takes the results of her Twitter polls? The polls have to be short, which means she cannot differentiate between 
regional differences, such as British and American English, are they purely promotional? Or does she actually use the results? And if so, how? What do you get out of these polls, Ellen? What's in it for you? Well, they they are... If I were, I'd have to be a much more organized person than I am to be doing polls in a per, purely per, promotional way. Um, if people who people who really interact with me a lot will know that I sometimes post ten in a row. Well, ten might be exaggerated, but I'll post eight in a row because I'm suddenly thinking about a bunch of stuff, and then I won't be there for three days, and I'll come back and post one. It's not. I don't have the whole. <laughs> I have not refined the promotional thing. If that's what they are, they really are exactly the same idea as the table was um, in line with a shirt that I have. I have a grammar t-shirt right now, by the way, I'm wearing, I, you can't all see it, but I have an, I love grammar t-shirt on. Um, I heart grammar t-shirt on, but I have one of my favorite ones says grammar hedonist, grammar hedonist. So I am a pleasure seeker at the grammar table and in my grammar table polls, they are for fun. I don't use them for, I don't even remember if I cited any in my book. I don't, think I did because usually um, I, I will sometimes post them when I'm writing, but it's more to help me think something through because I want to know, are people thinking the way I'm about this or do they have different feelings or is there sub topic that I might not think of, especially across different Englishes that I might not have exposure to. Um, it sounds like what you're saying is that you, you just, are, you just have a curiosity. You just want to find out and you just want to have a discussion. Yeah. No, I, I really do want to, I mean, that's the grammar table. Before I had the grammar table, I was online in language groups all the time I'm talking about language. I had, I belong, I, I belonged, I don't, I think I still do belong to hundreds of language groups on Facebook. And I just was sitting there talking all the time. So I just moved it outside. Uh, so it didn't really change that much about my life, except make me uh, physically on people's route to the subway. <laughs> I'm, I'm interpreting everything Ellen just said as, Twitter polls are her like cluster of peeled grapes that she holds aloft as she like reclines on a divan being like, oh, I'm not I do actually eat so many grapes. So that's a great metaphor. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I also, I mean, I am aware that Twitter polls are not scientific, so I don't use them, you know, because they're not, they're not controlled scientifically. Um, I do think I'm pretty good at constructing polls because I think through options and there was one thing in there I think in the question about British versus American English they have to be short so there's not room there is a way depending on the topic I can often pull like in a secondary poll I can post about different you know in, like what what English do you speak um, and get additional information that way so I do sometimes have it like a nested trio maybe to find out more information on that front but I also sometimes post polls where I already perfectly well know that both the options are totally um, that I've offered are totally fine. One is used way more in British English. One is used way more in American English. And it's more that's meant to be more like an educational tool. Like, hey, did you know that this was happening on the other side of the Atlantic? I have noticed that you do find you are very, very good at finding that one little seesaw point where it's 50-50 and you bring in you you add things to the examples where you just know it's gonna it's gonna take things. You know, ambiguous. You know exactly where to put the tip of the crowbar so you that know just what a little doing. bit of pressure just busts you it all wide what you're open. Doing. Angry balls. Wow. Do you want to ask your question? Let me know I where am, you are. I am here. Yes, I am here. Hey. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Uh, so I feel like my question is a bit is a bit out of sync with the with the rest of the episode so far because. Uh, it's a bit more of a philosophical question. I'm non-linear. Don't even worry about it. Okay, <laughs> That's okay. fine. Yeah, yeah. Well, Non-Euclidean. Da da Daniel said it was um, grammar in a very wide sense. And I suppose we, we could draw a link with the fact that people are very passionate about grammar, about grammar rules and following the stuff they learned. So my question is essentially, how much do people own the grammar of their idiolect, if you may. Um, like if if you're going to do a study or even if, if you're going to write a paper, where is the cutoff point between needing to ask for people's consent when using records of their, their speech and not needing to ask for their consent. For example, if, if you've heard someone say something and you wrote it down, do you need to ask for their consent? 
or you obviously do if you've recorded their voice but where is the cutoff point in your opinion how much do people yeah own i think these the I, these? I actually think these are very interesting questions not just about grammar but about writing um the writing process i'm not a scholar um so i don't my i was trained I have an undergraduate degree in German and I have a, a, a master's degree in comparative literature. Um, and I, so I don't undertake scholarly work and I'm more of a writer and an editor type and I love language learning. Those are my main areas. So I, I've studied a lot of languages and I've had those other things. And I teach writing and grammar to adults. So I, 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 if, I, if I had a formal paper um, in, a, in a research context, maybe I'd be following slightly different guidelines I don't know but for me as a writer I think about this a lot and it was a struggle for me when I wrote my book Rebel with a Clause about my adventures at the at the grammar table because I don't want ever for people I don't want people to feel bad I want them to feel comfortable telling me things um in general if someone let me give you an example if someone sends me an email tell on Christmas telling me that he's repulsed by the fact that I discussed the F word in my book, I am probably going to quote him in my next book, but not name him. Not that that right. happened. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, like, <laughs> ripped from the pages of the reel. So I get people writing me emails a lot, and I'm definitely going to use some of the, the stuff that I have in there. I'll use questions or stories that they told me as long as I feel I'm not violating their privacy, and this is a human judgment, but also I change details so that they're not identifiable. And those things I feel fairly comfortable with. People who come to the table, I, I mean, I tell their stories all the time. But again, in the book, when I wrote the book, I said I'm moving the state, you know, I'm moving uh, some locations and changing details. Like I'll change a two to a three. You know, I speak three languages, I'll change it to two or vice versa. I live in Michigan. If it's someone who lives in Michigan and I feel like, I don't know, the story is so is idiosyncratic that maybe his neighbors will recognize him. I might relocate him and change other details. So I'm quite protective of people. And it's actually, I think I'm more protective than the average writer. And it actually is a little bit limiting. It's something that I struggle with all the time because to write, you have to tell truth, you know, but yeah. I also don't want people to feel bad. Yeah. I like that question a lot. So for me, that is very relevant because this is, these are about human tale. For me, hum, people share personal human tales. I have to treat those with respect. So that, that, that matters to me very much. And thank you for that question. Yeah. All right. Can I add well, something? Please. Um, this was uh, a sort of related to a discussion that was had on tumblr for ages ago um, <laughs> which was blow the dust off that reference <laughs> <laughs> well it was just there was a tumblr where people were posting sort of fun quirky examples from language corpora that linguists have written about in their grammars because linguists like to use natural language so we like to record people and then just, um, you know, write about what we find in those natural recordings but um, people were feeling that and sometimes if you record a lot of people, they're going to say some funny stuff, right? They're going to say, you know, their kid did a funny thing or something funny happened or they say something that's nonsensical or something. And sometimes that illustrates an interesting grammatical phenomena. So the linguist puts it in their grammar and then people look at this and they say, well, it's a speaker is like talking nonsensical. And it feels like making fun of the speakers. But also, if you recorded me all day, which, I mean, ironically, we kind of do record me a lot and I do say funny <laughs> things, <laughs> right? Like, it's it's quite natural, but but it does, but, I mean, in that case, people sort of make fun of maybe individual speakers, but they do, like, linguists try to, like, have informed consent, but it's hard to know where those limits are because we're also just so interested in the things people produce. Um, and it's not, yeah, it's not always easy. I see this in medical kinds of contexts too. I mean, just, I, I think there are quite a few professionals who are not careful enough with the data that comes to them. I mean, you see it if you ride in an elevator in a medical building here, you mm. hear people talking about medical professionals talking about things they shouldn't be talking about or an receptionists answering phones in medical offices. And you can hear the person's personal data being talked about or it's on speaker. I mean, crazy stuff like that. So I really try to be careful. I do think in principle, in principle, what people post on social media publicly for us all to see, you know, if someone yeah. tweets something, 
um, I feel like that's that's public domain. On the other hand, I still temper that by thinking about how I'm using it. If I'm using it as this person is, a, you know, this. I mean, I just gave you an example of someone who emailed me on Christmas, and I thought it, it wasn't a very kind email. I didn't like the email. I don't. Mm -hmm. Since since Twitter is searchable, it's not like a you know like a database where it's all pooled anonymously. Someone can just go search something I write about and mm -hmm. find that person and harass them. I wouldn't I wouldn't feel comfortable with that either. So there are lots of competing things, and I, a lot of it's logic. Like what as a human being would I find tolerable um, and fair? Let's move it to our favorite game, related or not. I'm I'm not going to sing this time. I'm, okay. Look at look at me growing like a human being. Nobody has uh, nobody has said as a theme yet, but I just put out the call. So if you are a musician and you want to donate a track to us, just a five second thing. Why not? Let's see what happens. Um, hey Diego, I pulled one of yours, and it was annoy. Do you want to come on and do it, or do you want me to do it? Yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, which one? Annoy, and then the uh, uh, and then a similar word in Italian. Do you remember that one? Right. Uh, yes. Uh, annoyare. That's the one. Uh, how did you come across this? Are you a speaker of Italian? Um, uh, not not uh, natively, but it's one of the languages that I've studied, and I have family in Italy, so I'm, you know, conversational. I guess we could say. Okay. Well, um, I'm launching it. Here we go. Yeah. We've got right. English annoy to annoy someone, and Italian annoyare which means to bore, to bore someone. They look pretty similar. People are voting. What do you reckon? Anybody? Let's have, let's have comments from the five of us or the four of us. I immediately went not because it feels too good. It feels too easy. <laughs> the cynic in me is just like, mm, mm, the beautiful woman has walked into the bar and just immediately taken an interest in me. Well, something is amiss, right? Something is awry here. Diego wouldn't do you that way. Uh, I don't know about that. He's got that beautiful, disarming, outlandish, good I look smile. I know, I know. And yet. Okay. Uh, Ellen, what's your instinct? I remember from my Italian studies that this struck me. And I have no idea. And I'm going to just <laughs> go, with, <laughs> go with not related just okay. because. Hedvig, because I went with related because okay. I Excellent. think that it's through French and that kind of spelling in English reads French loan and French and Italian are related. Okay. More closely than either okay. of them are to English. Well, I said, I bet it's a false friend and I bet it's related to ennui because I know that French has s'ennuyé. But it's a trap. So I said not related. After all, they mean different things. Okay. Uh, it looks like many of us have voted. I am going to show the results. What we said was... Hmm. Ooh. Two thirds, one third. Two thirds of us said related. One third of us said not related. Diego, what are the beans? Ready to spill them? Yes. So they are related. Oh, uh, oh no. to Latin. <laughs> yeah, so the, they both go back to uh, a phrase in Latin having a uh, meaning uh, be uh, like hateful to me. It's something that, you know, somebody would find uh, hateful. So, uh, you know, in English, it came to mean, you know, uh, somebody who's bothering you. But uh, in Italian, it actually means uh, to bore somebody. So mm. that's also bothersome. Yes, very much so. Absolutely, yep. yeah. Yep, that's what I've got. In Latin, there was a word odium, to hate, and you'll recognize it because it comes to us in odious, hateful, but it also worked its way into late Latin, inodiare, and you can see how that sounds like annoy, but also ennui. Uh, and then, uh, so from from there, Latin inodiare went different ways. It went to enojar in Spanish, which means to make someone mad. French ennuyé to bore and Italian annoyare to bore and then to annoy in English. Awesome. So Thank it's actually you. a little bit of a um, like it's it's it 
Does it strike anyone else as quite strange that it morphed in a really similar way in both English and Italian, but it morphed in a very different way in French? You would have, like like Hedvig was saying, I would have expected that French and Italian probably would have morphed in a more similar way than English and French did. Um, yeah, it's it's odd that we both, like, as both languages are like, A-N-N-O-Y seems like the way we want to do this, and everyone else is like, that's weird, don't do that. Actually, in French, it means both. Oh, okay. Oh, right. To annoy, I like how Spanish fastidiar. If somebody's fastidious in English, that means they're fussy. But if something is fastidioso, it's like, ah, oh, bugs me. It's still my fastidia. So there's a lot of stuff like that. Hey, Diego, thank you so much for that. And for all of the stuff you bring, you are a legend. Oh, he's, he's so lovely. I just <laughs> love Diego. He's great. <laughs> I know. Okay, um, I have one more. I think we'll get time for one more. And this one, let's go with uh, one from Angry Balls. And this one is about ice. Angry, you want to take it? No, he is definitely here. We know this. We know he's here. I, I am here, but I, I, I don't have it. Uh, I don't have it in front of my ears, so I, I, I'm afraid I can't repeat it uh, fr from memory. Okay, oh, that's cool. That's Daniel, cool. your time to shine. I've got it. This is <laughs> this is my time. Okay. So we've got three different words. Here we go. Now there are words for icy things. One is in Spanish, it's hielo, hielo, and that means ice. There's Icelandic yokul. Oh, hang on. Hedvig as the Iceland, Icelandic Jason. adjacent person. Yokul? Actually, actually I, 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 can, I, can pronounce, I can pronounce it, actually. Oh, lovely. I, I did, I studied, I studied Icelandic <laughs> in university. <laughs> as as one does on a whim. Yeah. Go, go, go. I, I did Nordic studies, but like I have to pull up. Okay. So yellow, as I said, Icelandic Jökull. And so option number two, Icelandic Jökull and Northern uh -huh. Sami Jekna. Jekna. Okay. And third option, Northern, Northern Sami Jekna and Spanish yellow. And then okay. they're all related and not related. Ooh, tricky. They're all icy, and I'm way out of my comfort zone. Uh, Look, I'm, I'm, ben? I, well, sorry. It's a hard one. Well done. <laughs> I'm going to go with these are all related. I'm going to, I'm going to stick my flag in the uh, ice, as it were. Okay. And I'm going to I'm going to say these are all related and I'm going to say that because I've been reading The Clan of the Cave Bear and I'm like surely the proto-Indo-European word for ice when everything in Europe was super duper icy was just fairly consistent and so like it's filtered down into a bunch of proto-Indo-European sort of like air languages like um like H E I R. Okay. All right. Um Let's let's take it to Ellen. No idea, so I'm gonna vote again with no idea. Iceland, I'm gonna vote <laughs> that Icelandic and Northern Sami are the related ones. That's what I said too. Does, yeah, I thought sense, Spanish was an accidental similarity, and I thought that maybe the Sami was a borrowing, which would count as related, not genetically, but through borrowing. That's what it, that was my answer. Hedvig, what do you think? I think that none of them are related. Oh, bold. Oh. Love that. Um, well, it's just um, a gut feeling. Okay. Um, Iceland is like, like it, they do have is for ice, which might be cognate with the Spanish one. I don't know. But, uh, and mm. I don't think, I mean, Iceland was settled three times by Norwegian, Danish -ish people. Um, I don't think there would have been Sami loans. Yeah. Mm. None. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, Angry Balls. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to finish up this poll. Looks like uh, a few people really aren't sure about this one. We seem to lose our instincts here. <clears throat> I'm going to share the results. What we thought was that most of us thought none of them are related. Boo. But the close, uh, but a few people thought that Spanish and Icelandic had a cognate there. All right, Angry Balls, hit us with the facts. 
<laughs> I don't remember. I'm sorry. It was a long time ago. I don't <laughs> what a great <laughs> troll. That is wonderful. Well, it turns out I did the best research I could on this. This is why this is why I I uh I was saying to myself last night, I'm doing a lot of research for a show where I'm asking other people questions, but it's good. The answer is uh, as far as I can tell, none of them are related. So if you said none, <gasps> you were correct. Spanish hielo comes back to Proto-Indo-European gel, which is why we have things like congeal and things like that. But Icelandic yokul, uh, how does that double L sound? It's like, it's like a tch, tch. Like, like, it's you know, like a uh, right? yes. ah, yokul. Uh, it took a different course. It, went back to Proto-Germanic Yekulaz, and I couldn't take it back any farther than that. Northern Sami comes from a totally different language family from Proto-Finno-Ugric Yang. So, as far as I can tell, and please let me know if you are a comparative scholar, none of these are related. Wow. I think All the right. real crime here is that Hedvig is two and Ben is zero, and that's just intolerable. Not supposed to happen. Not supposed no, to happen. I don't care for that at all. Let's see. I am going to uh, take it to some more questions. And these were floated by our friends in Discord. Now, this one was inspired by Jonathan on Blue Sky. See, now uh, I saw Jonathan Owens uh, skeet on Blue Sky. And even though it's public, I said, hey, is it cool if I use this? And here's a link. Jonathan, are you, by the way, in attendance? Because uh, if you are, I'll peg you. I'll, I'll pin you. I don't think he is. He isn't. Okay, yeah. darn. Don't peg uh, people, Daniel. Don't. Well, well, I mean, you can, but I, I, I don't peg them in this context. I knew it as soon as I said it, but then pinning people wasn't, you know, you can, that, anyway. Of, of the two, I think there is a less bad choice. It's all what you're into. So, Jonathan says, <laughs> skeets. Any sentence where skeet appears is already just suspect. I'm re-watching BoJack Horseman. Okay. And am once again thinking a lot about the semantics of three young boys stacked on top of each other in a trench coat. We are, of course, talking about a, like the classic trope of like kids trying to get into somewhere. Have you not watched Bojack, Ben? Uh, I mean, not recently enough to remember three people stacked on top of each other. Oh, OK. Well, we are, of course, talking about one of the characters, Vincent Adult Man, who is Princess Carolyn's uh, boyfriend in season one and gotcha. season two. The Bojack Wiki describes Vincent as three kids stacked up on each other. Okay. Gotcha. Jonathan continues. Oh, and wasn't there a joke? Bojack says, your boyfriend is obviously three boys stacked on top of each other. And she says, oh, you always hate my boyfriends. <laughs> Jonathan continues. Each other implies that the stacking is reciprocal, meaning that each boy is stacked on each other boy. This doesn't make much sense since a, a, oh, lower, <laughs> a lower boy can't be stacked on an upper boy. And <laughs> I forgot to unpin. I pinned Angry Balls, but then I forgot to unpin him. You, you're always, it's very important to unpin someone after you've pinned them. Um, this doesn't make much sense since a lower boy can't be stacked on an upper boy. And you can't be stacked on two people unless you're on top. Let's just meditate on that for a while. Yes. Wow, we're getting real deep now. So is it would, it, would it be quite wrong to say that Vincent, adult man, is three boys stacked on top of each other? Should we, should we not say that? Well, question, is it possible that the three boys are identical triplets? And so there is some sort of roster to the stacking, meaning that at mm -hmm. any given instance of Vincent, adult man, you were getting a different person in the stack order. See these eyes? <laughs> squinting i'm pretty sure that the genetics of these boys does not figure in to the semantics does, of the sentence but but okay if we were to say that the the order changes right given that like every time you encounter vincent adult man it might be a different stack order but you're referring to vincent adult man not in a specific moment in time but in some sort of like generic socratic sense like the idea of vincent adult man then they are stacked on top of each other because you know Ever really know because they could be in any permutation of that stack. Thank you for your insight. <laughs> you were just like, shut the fuck up, Ben. <laughs> so, had to go ahead. 
<laughs> Go ahead, babe. I've just been making this squinty face for a couple of minutes. So I don't think that's how the words on top of each other, stacked on top of each other works. Like, I think you say it about all parts and that the last part is, it's like uh, people are in a line or in a queue after each other. The last person, the first person is not after someone. Yeah. Like that's like, sort of just how those things, like, like we I've know that little, that's how they work. I've got a little stack of board games here, like little baby ones, right? These board mm -hmm. games are stacked on top of each other and no one yeah. is looking at that and being like, why aren't they in a circle? But I, yeah. you know, I know, I actually, I know Jonathan a bit and uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that he would not have any concern about using each other in that expression. This sounds like his brain operating in a way it's that I actually can relate. I can relate to, <laughs> and I enjoy it. And, and also um, one of the main ways I got to know Jonathan um, was because of his position on non the punctuation of non-restrictive one word of positives because we are in agreement on that issue. <laughs> so, like, which is about, and I liked, he's written about it and I enjoyed what he wrote about it. Um, like what do you punctuate? If you have, do you punctuate my sister comma, Susie oh. comma will be at the party or is it my sister Susie, no punctuation will be at the party, that kind of thing. No comma. No but are you, not a comma are, fan. Too many are you all, are you are you all aware that you're often told to think about whether there's more than one sister or not? And if you have more than one sister, don't put commas. And if you have one sister, do put commas. So I was I was Jonathan not I, aware of that. <laughs> Jonathan and I, I think I can say. I hope you won't mind that I say this. I feel that we share a concern about that punctuation guideline because it it gets a little silly. Because I don't want to punctuate my husband. But the argument, the snarky argument is that if you don't punctuate your husband, it means you have more than one spouse. And in the modern era of polycules, you know, these these <laughs> distinctions increasingly are going to matter. Language <laughs> is a low uh, resolution representation of reality. It does not, <laughs> it is not intended to express things in fine detail. Good enough is good enough. So that's kind of where I was going with this, actually. I was thinking, does each other have to be reciprocal? Like if I have three board games in the corner and one of them is on top of the other and then the other, what if, what if I got two? What if I got two boxes in the corner and one box is on top of another box? Yes, I could say, as uh, folks in chat are suggesting, one box on top of the other. But we always say the, box, the two boxes were stacked on top of each other. I don't think that each other has to be reciprocal, especially not pairwise reciprocal for three things. Idiom. I'm just going to say the Can word I idiom. Just say, it's, just yeah, yeah, yeah. it's an yeah. idiom for sure. There is this lovely research project on reciprocal things. And um, they had to record a bunch of videos where they did things like uh, one per there are four people at a table and one person is giving one thing to all of them or everyone is at the same time giving another thing to everyone or they're giving in turn. They're all doing all these like possible permutations of sort of reciprocal events. There's one when they're chasing each other and trying to play tag, but they're all like doing this in an office building in Netherlands that I happen to have worked yeah. at, which has like crazy architecture. So none of these poor people that they showed it to on the other side of the world could always like figure out what's going on. And they're also so funny because it's so funny to see like four people give identical objects to each other at the same time. It it's seems like, like a square dance, but like with cafes, like, like, and yeah, then we turn to so the It's so funny. They're all so funny. And it's, it's extra funny for me because there's some of the people I've known and they're like 20 years younger and like really like baby faced. Um, <laughs> but anyway, they publish a bunch of different, like the way reciprocal things work in different languages are not, are not the same. Yeah. And it's kind of fun. Yeah. I can recommend it. The fun thing about each other constructions is the old Chomskyan sentence. Uh, the men wanted me to listen to each other. The men wanted me to listen to each other, which just hits us that wrong. Doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't, that doesn't, doesn't work, work in my head at all. There's something about each other that implies that whatever the action is, it has to be performed by one of the each other participants. Somebody else can't just walk into the sentence and do something to each other. It's got to be one of the participants. And it's a really good example to point out that we know things about language that we haven't been explicitly taught. It's fun. Definitely. 
most right. things it, it turns out about language that I know I have not been explicitly taught. Woo. Okay, this will be one from O Tim. And he hasn't he's not here right now, but he oh, has left us Tim. I'm gonna share a sound file. And this one came from SpeakPipe, and you know how much we love the SpeakPipe Yay. things. It's happening. Okay. It's working. I know, I know, little by little. Here we go. Hi, oh Tim here. And I have a question for Ellen Joven. I'm a court reporter in the United States, taking down in writing everything said in a courtroom or office. A dreaded non-word came up recently. A child was asked why her mom referred to her as a pig, and her response was, mm. oh. The judge immediately made the record clear, you don't know? And the child answered more fulsomely, supposing it was because she was messy. My immediate reaction was, if a transcript is ordered, how am I going to spell that? And from out the corner of my brain, I heard, mm, <laughs> how would you suggest spelling? Mm, and don't give me the same answer my brain gave me. What would you have done, Ellen? Thank you. Okay. Best question Isn't that ever. great? <laughs> also, that voice. That was yeah, a good I voice. Know, right? no, that the was fact that that voice. man's voice is not spoken in his work because he's just sitting there silently recording what everyone else says hurts yeah. my heart. <laughs> I asked my seven-year-old daughter how she would spell it, and she said, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Take it, Ellen. I, I, don't, I don't have an answer for that. I'm terrible. Actually, when, I, I had issues with these when I was writing my book because apparently there are some standardized forms for things that I didn't realize. Not the this one, not this one, but, you know, some of the utterances that are kind of on the border between standard speech and sound. I can't even think of a good example right now, but I think the copy editor led me to, oh, like maybe one was mm -hmm. like, I didn't even, mm -hmm. I didn't know there was mm -hmm. any kind of standard for that. So I was just free, free dialing it and that, that wasn't acceptable, <laughs> but I don't know. I think it sounds, I, I don't think there's any satisfactory um, option there. I think I probably would do an alternation between M and N because it sounded like there was a little, because you can't capture the, the pitch changes though. So I would just do that and then rely on the, the judge intervening with good sense to make sure that there's an actual record there. I would just like to say though, to that questioner that I'm very interested in the whole court reporting thing. And I've been trying to get more, th like get get gigs like and because i think that just seems that seems like like my kind of people you know i would be interested <laughs> my tribe i would be interested because i have to record a lot of things from speech acts that are difficult to figure out but i don't have a good answer for him so is that the same answer his brain gave him that he didn't have a good answer yeah Sorry. i think so <laughs> does anyone have a suggestion here yeah, we're, wondering... we're seeing them in chat actually go ahead ben. oh we are okay let's look let's go look here I was sort of wondering if, and I fully appreciate, I don't understand the um, strictures of uh, what's stenography. That's the official name for what um, Otim does, right? He's a stenographer. Yep. Um, I don't know if this would be an acceptable thing, but I feel like mm is a hummed version of I don't know. Yeah, right. Like surely that that's the that's the lineage of where mm comes from. Yes. So is it is it possible to just type in parentheses hummed version or like hummed utterance? I don't know. Oh, interesting. Or like sub sub vocal. I don't know. Hum. That's. I believe the Court Reporters there. Association. I believe the National Court Reporters Association here has a style book, and I'm sure oh, that they okay. weigh in on that kind of stuff. I'm right. going to guess that they're not supposed to do that. I actually like, I like Liz's version. For me, that's the, you know, the closest to something that I feel like people would sort of recognize, but I'm sure there, there's specific guidance on there. I, that, I just don't happen to have that particular style guide, although I really want it. And I think I tried to obtain one. Linda, what you got? <laughs> I used to teach court reporter stenographers. Oh, and shit. yes. Oh, there we go. There we go. And, and yes. In their transcript, when it's a nonverbal response, for example, and they just shake their head yes or no, the um, the stenographer, unless hopefully you would hope that the judge would ask for clarification, like you said, oh, to be clear, the the uh, the, the witness is 
is affirming uh, with a head nod, yes. But when they don't, they put in parentheses the um, the witness. In this case, you could, they could put the, the child. And I like what, uh, what Ben said, um, hummed an utterance that means I don't know and, and parentheses. Yes. And they oh, indent nice. in the transcript and blah, blah, blah. There, there are stylistic things they have to do, but that's what they do. Okay. So good. Thank you for your expertise. This is why we do these in the live show, right? We need we need Linda on every show from this point forward <laughs> all the say. time to just make me sound good. <laughs> it happened once. You already sound good. Ben, you already no. sound, you yeah. already sound See good. See what I mean? See what I mean? I need a lot of guys in. <laughs> You're out. No compliments. <laughs> I am going to share what Tim's answer was because he gave us an answer as well. Here it is. Okay. The transcript actually was requested and I chose to use mm hyphen then mm in all caps followed by a hyphen and then another lowercase mm so there we that's go that's interesting but i do like the clarification as well there is a way hey did you have an answer because i didn't hear from you and i wonder if you've got anything i don't have anything interesting to say i would also okay. try and do parentheses to clarify like linda said and like lots of other people say because like written language is good for certain things and not and for, really bad for other things yeah. and really yeah. bad for other things like it's bad at tone and sort of body language moves what a surprise right <sighs> so yeah it seems it seems like extra material is needed i just love how you can strip out the words and and just use the international contour and it means the same thing there is a way to do this in the international phonetic alphabet. And Steele is getting there with his comment where he used M with tone indicators that go medium, high, medium. Um, they have tone diacritics. I've never used them, so I'm not very skillful, but there are five levels to choose from, from extra low, uh, low, medium, high, and extra high. So I'm going to try it. If I go, mm, the first one feels kind of medium, so that's a mid-tone, I think. The second one is a little higher, so high, and then back down to mid. And I'm putting in chat how this would go. So according to the IPA oh. tone notation, you would start with an M with a macron. That's the little line across the top. And that would be your mid-tone. Then you go to high, and that's an M with an acute accent. And then back down to mid, that's your M with the macron. And that's how you go, mm. And that wouldn't be very helpful if you didn't know the IPA, but that's one <laughs> way to do it. What do you reckon? Ben's gone. He's left. He's like, I'm out. Ah, uh, well, oh Tim, thank you so much for that one. Your contributions are appreciated. Um, Ellen, I just want to ask one more question. You've got a lot of experience in grammar, but as we know, grammar is social. It has a social side. What kind of social insights about language have you gained from your experience at the table? Cat. 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 Get it, get it, get it. <laughs> what social insights? Well, um, that that some people feel a lot of pain about language things. I already knew that from teaching. So I've, I I taught for a couple of decades before I ever did this. But, <laughs> I was a teacher. So, I know pain. <laughs> <laughs> but I I mean I teach adults just to be clear. But I can see that people. People feel they, they suffer. And I think everyone here knows that. You've seen people who feel that way or maybe about some things you felt that yourself sometimes. And um, what has struck me is that the right bit of information delivered at the right moment in the right way can do a lot to re give relief, like a small bit of kindness with a small bit of information because so many of the um, of the anxieties are wrapped up in maybe things that aren't the most central about communicating effectively. I mean, I'm not saying, I, I think, you know, I think it's important to be trained for professional, our professional lives. I think it's for most of our professional lives, it's useful to be trained in formal written English. If that's what we're using, if that's the language of our work, it, it, it's helpful and uh, um, gets, you know, it's a, it's a skill that I value in my life. Um, but often people are worried about things that really aren't an issue. Like some, trivial little thing that really isn't central and they have such a beautiful email style or they're warm and encouraging people. Um, and I hate seeing people like that suffer for something because they think they remember something from seventh grade that's not actually even true. And it's time to outgrow seventh grade at some point. <laughs> <laughs> 
may I say one more? Um, there's one more thing, which is you never know who the grammar nerds are walking among us. You may think you know, but it's regularly not the person carrying the books and wearing spectacles. It's, it you know, it could be off. the guy. It could be. <laughs> It could be the guy in the black leather cape with blue hair. You know, you just never, in spite, like a spiked necklace, you just never know. People are full of surprises. And so it's really, I found it to be a great way to combat the human inclination to start to stereotype type based on life experience. And I appreciate that a great deal. We have been talking to not just fixture, not just institution, but national treasure, an honorary Because Language <laughs> co-host, Ellen Joven, proprietor Definitely. of The Grammar Table. She's the author of Rebel with a Clause, Tales and Tips from a Roving Grammarian, which we've done on the show before last, I think it was a while ago now, but uh, it's a ripping read. Ellen, thanks so much for coming and hanging out with us today. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you for the honor of having me back a fourth time. Uh Thanks also to Speech Docs, who transcribes all the words. And most of all, thanks to patrons like all of you who make the whole show happen. We literally could not do this without you. So thanks. Let's take it to the reads. Oh, and that means I need to pull up the reads. Hold on. Because... I've got you down for like the very last bit. So you can. Oh, okay, cool. Maybe I should get Ellen to do that bit. Oh, yeah. Also, just don't give me a bit. I like that. I always I like that. I won't give you a bit, okay. Ellen. I'm pasting this in chat. Hedvig, take it away. Hey. This has been a really fun show, and we like to continue making our show. And one of the things that makes that possible is to support from listeners like you who choose to donate a little bit of money every month on patreon.com. You can support Because Language that way. Um, you can also tell a friend about us or tweet about us or blue blue sky post. I just got a blue sky. Woo, woo, woo. Um, you can do whatever, uh, if you like something that we did, tell people about it. If you don't like what we did, tell us about it and don't tell other people about it, I think is, uh, my, my preferred. Um, you can also find us on most of the places because we are because slang pod, one word. And, uh, you can send us ideas and comments for like, for example, for good examples for, um, it for a lot of times you can also send us examples in email for uh, related or not we're um, particularly interested in things that uh, sound like they are related but are not related because we get a lot of things that are related but now that I've said that Daniel's gonna have to jumble them somehow so that I don't know what to expect uh, anyway get in touch <laughs> it's fun to hear from you you can also become a patron. Your support means the regular episodes are free for everybody. It means we can get transcripts from speech docs so that our shows are readable and searchable. How many times has Hedvig mentioned uh, hating Lime Green? You can check by yeah, looking yeah, through our transcripts. You can, you can search it. Yep. I think it's at least twice. <laughs> Way more. Way more. Um, well, the number of mentions is proportional to the dislike. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can also get bonuses depending on your level. There's Discord access, mail outs, live episodes, bonus episodes, and you get shout outs like this one. So here are our great patrons at the supporter level. Termi, Matt, Whitney, Helen, Jack, Ferrocat, Lord Mortis, Elias, Grammarian, Larry, Renee, Christopher, Andy B, James, Nigel, Meredith, Kate, Nasrin, Joanna, Nikolai, Keith, Aisha, Steele, Margaret, Manu, Diego, Arya Flame, Roger, Rian, Colleen, Ignacio, a lot of you aren't there, Kevin, Andy from Logophilius, Stan, Kathy, Rosh, Cheyenne, Felicity, Amir, the Kenny Archer, Oh, Tim, Tim. Alyssa, Chris, Angry Balls, Tig, Luis, Raina, Tony, and Wolf Dog. Many thanks to all of our patrons. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mwah, smooches. Okay, Ellen, take it away. Take us out. From the words, our theme music, right? That's it. Correct. Am I allowed to just say that if anyone, um, anyone who complains about my using the F word in my book, they should see this chat transcript. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, that wasn't the time. That wasn't my responsibility. Wait, let me see what I was supposed to say. <laughs> Our theme music was written and performed by Drew Propliano. Okay who also performs with Ryan Benno, Benno and Didion's Bible. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. Because language. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.